Hey, what's up? Welcome to this episode of Gear Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about bindings, these things in front of me, these things that hold you to your skis. And I actually do a little bit more than that these days. And there's a lot of intricacies about bindings that are not known, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about bindings. So we're going to kind of break that down and hopefully give you the knowledge to make a selection for yourself. So the goal of binding seems very simple. It's to keep you in your skis, right? Well, if that were the only goal, we'd just screw ourselves to our skis. But since that isn't an option that's readily available, there's got to be something else. And that something else is actually releaseability. You need to be able to release away from your skis when it's absolutely necessary to keep healthy, to keep your lower body safe from injury. You see, when your skis don't release in the event of a fall, it can cause serious bodily harm. Here, I'll show you a little example. So this is what happens in a tumble when your skis don't release. That's your knee. And this is the classic backwards twisting fall. Not good. You see, a modern alpine binding has dual purpose. It's supposed to keep you in your skis when necessary and also eject you from them when there's a chance for a lower leg injury. It's since the modern alpine binding was invented in the 1970s, they've actually seen in studies that leg injuries and skiing have gone down. So they're doing their job. Now that you know that, let's get into the selection of bindings. So first we're going to go through alpine bindings and what to look for in them. So what defines an alpine binding is the bindings that fall under the ISO norm. ISO is the International Organization for Standards, a qualification of alpine norm. Alpine norm bindings all go through rigorous testing to ensure the releaseability, the reliability and safety of a binding. There are numerous calculated and qualitative tests that all alpine bindings go through to be qualified under the ISO norm of alpine binding. Now there are three subcategories of alpine bindings. You've got your traditional alpine bindings, you've got frame bindings, and the newly invented hybrid bindings. Alpine bindings in the most traditional sense are your traditional downhill only bindings, meaning they have no capability for touring. They're bindings you know and trust and their common form was started in the 1970s and has evolved over the decades. Examples of an Alpine binding are your Solomon STH2 or your Solomon Warden MNC. You're going to be using Alpine bindings for 100% downhill skiing with the up provided by chairlifts, trams, snowcats, or if you're a doctor or pro skier, helicopters. These days, what I'm looking for primarily in traditional Alpine bindings is two things, compatibility and elasticity. And a lot of bindings are similar, but those two characteristics are truly what define what I'm looking for in an alpine binding. Things like height, screw pattern, and footprint can be factors, but in all my testing of all the major binding brands out there, what defines the bindings I love most is compatibility and elasticity. So for compatibility, what that means is the widest range of ski boot soles a binding can work with. So there are four widely accepted boot soles seen on ski boots today. Those are Alpine soles, WTR soles, or otherwise known as walk to ride, grip walk, and touring soles. And if you notice the MNC title I said on the Warden, so that stands for multi-norm compatible. So when you see this MNC title, that works for all ski boot soles. Not all bindings are MNC, so this is a huge bonus for a binding purchase. And the other thing I look at, elasticity. Well, elasticity is the amount of distance a binding can move before releasing. So if the elasticity is labeled on a binding at 40 millimeters, well, the binding can move 39 millimeters before releasing. And why does this matter? Well, elasticity not only increases the consistency and therefore safety of release, personally to me, it's a lot about feel as well. You see, elasticity is kind of like shock absorption for your body. It actually takes all the vibration that's built up in your skis during a turn, and that usually goes right up into your ankles and knees and absorbs it. It actually makes your turns more powerful and cleaner. 
I learned all of this when I was testing skis and bindings in France. I had on my left foot a binding with no elasticity, on my right foot a binding with elasticity. And as I went to carve with my left foot, I'd lose an edge and I would wash out. And on my right foot, the binding with elasticity, I would hold a clean, powerful carve. And that's when I learned this whole concept. Okay, so those are the two main things I look for in Alpine bindings. Personally, my favorite are the Solomon Warden MNC. I can use them with my touring boots because of that MNC qualification and it has 30 millimeters of elasticity. The STH2, this has a whopping 52 millimeters of elasticity, but it doesn't have the MNC qualification. It is still a favorite of the Solomon team and I still love the binding, but I also love my touring boots. So I ski on the Warden MNC. So now to the next category. So frame touring bindings were the first introduction of Alpine bindings that can tour. Examples of that are the Solomon Guardian, the Marker Duke, or the Tyrolia Adrenaline. A frame binding has all the benefits of an Alpine norm binding, but has the ability to tour. But there are some serious downsides to frame bindings, and they're quickly becoming obsolete in skiing. Now let's show some of those downsides. So the first downside of frame bindings is the pivot point. So the pivot point is pretty far forward and that causes for a very unnatural stride that is very different than your natural walking motion and that causes undue fatigue on your hip flexors, on your butt muscles, just overall feels harder than it should be. That plus frame bindings are super heavy and you got to pick up the entire weight of the binding while touring. For the time they came out, they were pretty advanced. They did their job. They were good for short tours and skiing at the resort. But these days, they're a bit antiquated. So I would only recommend getting frame bindings if you can get some for very cheap and want to tour a tiny bit. Maybe 10% of your time skiing is spent touring and or you don't want to get boots with tech inserts, which leads me to the next category. So now to hybrid binding section of Alpine bindings. So there are only two examples of hybrid bindings in the market right now. The first being the binding that invented the category, the most game-changing product of the last 10 years, as named by the Blister Gear Review founder, Jonathan Ellsworth, the Solomon Shift MNC. Marker just introduced their first foray into this category with a Duke PT that is releasing this year. So a hybrid binding like the Shift is a binding that has all the Alpine norms of safety and releasability, but can tour. But it does only tour with a boot sole system that includes pins. You see, the Shift literally transforms or shifts from an Alpine binding to a touring binding and a pretty damn good touring binding at that. The Shift is MNC compatible, so it can work with all four soles of boots, though it can only tour with three of those four, like I mentioned before. It has a whopping 47 millimeters of elastic travel, so it already hits my top two categories of Alpine bindings. This truly is an Alpine binding first that is meant to use at ski areas to rip everywhere you want, with the added benefit that it can tour and tour really well. You see, with a hybrid binding, your pivot point is actually close to the ball of your foot, so it allows for that natural stride. Also, you're not picking up the entire weight of the binding like you do with frame bindings. So even if it were to weigh the exact same as a frame binding on a scale, it would still be more efficient and less tiring to tour with. Truly, these hybrid bindings are a marvel of both touring and alpine safety. So I would recommend a hybrid binding if you want a binding with ultimate capability and flexibility. If you tour anywhere from 20% to 50% of your time, and you want your favorite pairs of skis to be able to go anywhere, a hybrid binding is for you. The only downside to hybrid bindings are that you have to have a pin toe on your boot sole to tour. They're also definitely on the spendier side, and they aren't quite as light as our next category of bindings we will talk about. But truly, if you want a binding of the future, this is the category of binding to look for. Okay, so last style of binding, the touring binding, AKA, the tech binding, aka low tech or pin binding. It's a lot of different names for them. So overall, a touring binding falls into an entirely different ISO norm than Alpine norm standards. There's similar norms in certain ways, but very, very different in a few key areas. For instance, for a touring norm, they test for a lot of the same stuff as they do in Alpine bindings, including icing, vibration, shock, energy absorption, and load forces. 
Most importantly, Turing Gnome does not test for that oh-so-important elasticity, which most Turing bindings have almost none, location of release, and tests that quantitatively define in an accurate way pre-release, i.e. an unwanted release. To me, in a real-world experience, Turing norm is vastly different than Alpine norm and should be treated as such. So it defines a Turing binding as seen here in its form of the Solomon MTN binding. You have a pin insert on both the toe and the heel for the points of retention. From there, there are tons of different options in this field. What I'm looking for personally is durability, lightness, and strength. Those are all things found in this MTN binding, which is why it's probably becoming the underground cult favorite of many pros, guides, and diehard ski tours. What I'm not looking for in this category of bindings, and why I try to avoid, is many moving parts, because that can run counter to that durability factor, and any sort of releasability indexes. Because again, if it's a Turing norm binding, it's not held to the same standards as Alpine bindings. Lastly, add-ons like heavy heel pieces or DIN settings, because I've found both to be unnecessary. I want my tech bindings to be light, durable, and strong, and I suggest you look for the same. The benefits of a Turing binding are pretty obvious. First off, they're incredibly lightweight. They also have a pivot point that is close to your ball of your foot, so it allows for that natural stride. And overall, you can also lock it out when you're in those extreme ski situations where you never want your bind to actually come off. But they're limited, and we're gonna go into some of the downsides right now. The downside of touring bindings is long. First off, you should never ever ski them in a ski resort. I've had orthopedic surgeons anecdotally tell me they've seen an epidemic of spiral tib fib fractures related to the use of tech bindings at ski areas. Remember, these don't release like normal bindings, and when your bindings don't release in falling scenarios, that can cause catastrophic injuries. Another downside is the total opposite side of the equation. When skied in ski mode, they can create unwanted release in atypical scenarios, which is obviously a potential massive problem if skiing something steep or overexposure. Lastly, you have to obviously use them solely with that tech insert soles and truly understand the nuances, characteristics, and usage of them. To me, they're an expert-only binding, and they're designed solely for ski touring and people that only want to ski tour on them. Lastly, while the downsides are long, tech bindings are incredibly useful, and I use the heck out of them, along with thousands of other skiers. They serve a purpose, and I love them for many different reasons. You should just understand them before purchasing and using. Okay, so that's my guide to bindings. There are a few things I didn't cover, and I didn't cover them on purpose. I didn't talk about DIN settings, maintenance, adjustment, and mounting in this guide. That's because all of that is best done at your local ski shop, like this one right here, Tahoe Sports Hub. This overview should help you understand the field of bindings as a whole, but places like Tahoe Sports Hub and the people that work there, they should be best in helping you narrow down your selection, answer any questions I didn't answer, and get you set up best for the ski season. Well. Until next time, my friends, don't forget to hit the subscribe button too.